Good afternoon. I'm David Levy, Dean of the Duke Law School. Robert A. Katzman is one of the superstars of the federal judiciary. He is Chief Judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, and I'm sure he would tell you that that is the most storied circuit, the most influential circuit in the land, and he might well be right. Mm -hmm. uh, he was appointed by President Clinton in 1999. At that time, he was the Walsh Professor uh, of Government, Professor of Law, and Professor of Public Policy at Georgetown University. He was a fellow of the Governmental Studies Program at the Brookings Institution, where he had a long history, and he was president of the Governance Institute. Judge Katzman has a PhD in government from Harvard and a JD from Yale. His books include Judging Statutes, which we'll be talking about today, Regulatory Bureaucracy, the Federal Trade Commission and Antitrust Policy, and Courts and Congress. He has several other books that he's written as well. He chaired the United States Judicial Conference Committee on the Judicial Branch, which is a very important committee, and he serves as a member of the United States Judicial Conference, which is the governing body for the United States courts. He has received numerous awards and recognition, and he is a much sought after speaker. We are very lucky to have him here today. The discussion will focus on Judge Katzman's latest book, Judging Statutes, and how fitting it is uh, that we have here today two of our stars to discuss the book uh, with our, our author. Neil Siegel is the David Eichel Professor of Law and Political Science, and he is one of the nation's leading scholars of the United States constitutional law and theory, and with him is Associate Professor Marin Levy, whose work has done so much to illuminate the field of judicial administration. I will turn it over to Professor Siegel. Well, thank you very much, yeah. Dean, and welcome, yeah. Judge. Uh, we're thank very you. pleased to be able to uh, uh, spend some time with you. You've written an important book, uh, a book I should say that I teach in my statutory interpretation class, which are thank you. Our, our judge <laughs> students, the students in our uh, judicial studies program, and I teach it alongside uh, Justice Scalia's work on textualism. I use you as an exemplar of uh, legislative purpose, purposivism. And so um, there's uh, many questions that I think we both, we both have about the book, and we're, we're looking forward to your answers. And let me just start with um, the bottom line or the takeaway. What do you most want readers to take from the book? One, what one or two or three points do you think are key? Well, first let me say um, what a privilege and honor it is to, is to be here. Uh, distinguished panel, great constitutional uh, scholar and uh, great uh, scholar on of the world, real world of judicial administration, and to be here with with Dean Levy. Uh, you know, when you think about people who would be great Supreme Court justices, David Levy <laughs> is uh, is on my list. So um, he's on uh, my short list too. Yeah. So anyway, uh, that'll do him. Uh, my my takeaway is that uh, from the book is that, uh, that, that Congress uh, is a branch of government uh, and that the laws of Congress, the legislation that comes out of Congress, the people's branch, uh, should be understood by courts in a way that reflects how the members of Congress themselves expect their laws to be understood. So that is to say, the judge's role is to understand the purposes, what it was that Congress had in mind, and to uh, be respectful of the materials associated with that legislative process, which the members themselves expect courts to at least look at. And just, just as a follow-up here, so I mean, the starting point, of course, is that You'll have a statute from Congress, and some language will be ambiguous or vague, and so then it's to the courts to interpret that language. Um, I remember as a first-year law student thinking, well, why can't Congress just get its act together and do a better job? You know, what's, what's the problem here? Uh, and you do a great job in the book of laying out why it is that we have these ambiguities uh, to start with, but it would be helpful maybe just to, to let the room know. Some of them, of course, are intentional, 
uh, ambiguities, and some are accidental. Just to talk us through that a little bit. There's a uh, there's a uh, wonderful political scientist, uh, Herbert Kaufman, now in his 90s, uh, who uh, once wrote a book called Time, Chance, and Organizations. And in it, he said that uh, ambiguity is the solvent of disagreement uh, until there is a disagreement about the uh, resolution of that ambiguity. It's always temporary. So uh, ambiguity comes about because of uh, a number of reasons. One is, uh, as a, a price for getting uh, legislation passed, uh, legislation is, uh, can be ambiguously phrased, so it means all things to all people, and, 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 uh, and that is the price of coalition politics. Sometimes uh, it's not so much ambiguity but vagueness, where, where the law is, is vague, the Congress recognizes that there is a problem to be addressed. Uh, it doesn't know exactly how to address the problem, and so the language is uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat vague. And, and the audience for that kind of statute isn't so much the courts, it almost never is actually, it's the agency. And the idea is that agencies will tackle, tackle, the, tackle the problem. Um, then. Uh, ambiguity sometimes is a product of, uh, of mistake that, uh, or of inadvertence, that the legislative process can be messy, uh, especially uh, nowadays uh, where the legislative process often consists of these large omnibus bills that are passed at the end of a session uh, and mistakes are not cleared up. So there can be a number of different reasons for ambiguity. And then the judge's task is to try to make sense of that ambiguity. Well, you mentioned Congress's potential audiences. I'm wondering, who are your audiences in writing this book? Why are you writing this book now? Is it for, for, for other judges? Is it for members of Congress and their staffers? Um, who are your potential targets in writing this book? Is it Justice Scalia? Uh, well, it, 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 uh, uh, the way the, the, the book first got started, got started as a lecture uh, at NYU, the Madison, Madison lecture. And that was essentially uh, written for uh, the legal community, mostly judges and, 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 and law professors and, and law students. And I had a, uh, happened to be having a chance lunch with uh, Adam Liptak, who uh, used to cover the, the New York court speed. And so we were having lunch and uh, he had read the lecture, he had uh, been there, and he said, um, he said, you know, uh, you know, Bob, people, most people don't read lectures. And he said, have you thought of, of expanding this into a small book? And I had never thought of expanding it into a small book. Uh, and he said, while you're at it, try to write something that is accessible to the, the lay citizen, the intelligent citizen. And, um, and so the book actually represents an effort to try to reach different audiences. Um, obviously, uh, I'm interested in what my colleagues on the bench might have to think. I'm interested in uh, what legislators might have to think, what law professors uh, might have to think. I'd like to write something that's accessible for students, but also for the uh, interested uh, citizen. And um, I uh, put a chapter in the book that discussed uh, cases that I had to, uh, had to address, and um, um, some of which, all those cases uh, went up for Supreme Court review, some of which, some cases I was affirmed, one case I wasn't. Um, just to give the reader a sense of, of the issues involved and how different courts might look at the same issue. So, so you talked about your past work, so I want to I wanna bring you back. I want to go uh, way back. So obviously these are issues that you've been thinking about for quite some time, even before you came to the bench. Right? As the dean mentioned, so you went to Harvard, you got a PhD in government, you were studying under Professor uh, Moynihan, it feels funny to say Professor Moynihan, right? That was uh, something by chance, by fate, perhaps. Yeah. 
And um, from there, right, you go to Yale, and then you're at Brookings, and then you, you really focus on this relationship between Congress and the courts. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering how that background has informed your views in this book, maybe how your views have evolved over time. Um, so all those things. Well, I, I uh, was very much influenced by uh, three people, uh, especially in graduate school. Uh, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, James Q. Wilson, who is my uh, thesis advisor, and Richard Neustadt. And these were people who, uh, political scientists, who were very much interested in uh, how government functions, um, what are the limits of what government can do, uh, and within those limits, how can it do better what it, 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 it's doing. And so that concern with governance is something that um, very much influenced uh, me uh, and led me to the, uh, to the Brookings uh, Institution, which had a long history of, of uh, the study of, of governmental institutions and in some ways was kind of an oasis. Because in political science at the time, Harvard was uh, kind of an oasis in the sense that uh, most of the field in political science was moving towards very quantitative analyses that um, uh, were important but really didn't look to how government actually worked and, and what the determinants of uh, decision making were. And so that led me, uh, once I was at Brookings, uh, to look at the determinants of agency decision making. That was the FTC book. To look at um, the role of political institutions at the national level, the, the Congress, the executive branch, and the courts, um, through the uh, prism of, of uh, handicap policy, and try to see how, over a generation, policy is shaped by each institution, and then be able to say something about the functioning of each uh, institution. Um, and the courts and Congress work uh, came about really uh, because of um, an invitation that I had received from, from Frank Coffin, who was chief judge of the First Circuit, and who I knew because I had clerked on the First Circuit. And Judge Coffin had become uh, chair of the Committee on the Judicial Branch, which is a committee that deals with interbranch uh, relations. And um, it was geared primarily, actually, to getting a pay raise for judges. <laughs> But, but Judge Coffin was of the view that uh, this is not a very attractive way to um, sell that issue. And so um, he was very interested in looking at courts and Congress in terms of the flow of history, looking at the problems that existed between the branches. And in those days, uh, that committee was, was an irresistible uh, invitation because Judge Coffin was such an extraordinary person. He had been a uh, uh, high official in all three branches of government. He had been a member of Congress. He was chief judge of the uh, First Circuit. He was at AID. He was once referred to uh, uh, when he was introduced to give the Madison Lecture at NYU as a uh, walking violation of the separation of powers. <laughs> he had that kind of experience and gravitas and uh, gentility. Uh, it was really an amazing human being. Um, and that committee consisted of judges, uh, many of whom had legislative experience. Now there is only uh, uh, one judge uh, who was a member of, who had been a member of Congress, and that's a magistrate judge, Ed Bryant, in Tennessee. There are a number of, of, um, of uh, legislators who have been on congressional staffs, but who have not had that um, elected experience. In those days, this is in the 80s, you had a committee of several judges who had been members of Congress, members of the House, members of the Senate, you had people like um, um, Abner Mikva, uh, Charles uh, Wiggins, um, Hungate, uh, uh, Thomas Meskel, um, uh, Senator Russell of, uh, of, of, I think, South Carolina, um, Orrin Harris of uh, Arkansas, James Buckley, 
of uh, Washington, of, of, of New York, and later of the DC Circuit. And so um, it was really a tremendous opportunity for me to uh, work with those people. And then I also got to work with uh, Robert Kastenmeier, who uh, was the longtime chair of the uh, Subcommittee on Courts of the House Judiciary Committee. And um, so um, that's how I, how I really got into the subject in some depth. And uh, we had a symposium that looked at preliminary issues having to do with judges and legislators. Uh, and that was the first, it was at, at that lecture, it was a, or colloquium, it was the first time that uh, Justice Scalia and, and Judge Breyer, then Judge Breyer, talked about uh, their differences in legislative uh, history. Then I uh, distilled some of that into a, a book of essays. And then later on, as a judge, I, when I was asked to do the Madison lecture, I thought this is a good time to return to that subject, having been a judge for many years at that point. So let me put on the table two possible ways of reading you in the book. And you can tell me whether um, one is right or neither is right. Because I see uh, different possibilities, and they're, at least to my mind, in some tension with each other. So from one point of view, you're writing a book uh, that uh, puts into written form much of what you just described, which is you're interested in how branches <clears throat> of government function. You've worked with and learned from practical statesmen. You don't have really uh, time for grand theories of statutory interpretation. Academics can debate textualism versus purposivism versus pragmatism versus dynamic. And, you know, but, you know, judges in the real world trying to solve difficult problems don't have time for that. So that, it's almost like you're doing for statutory interpretation what uh, my old judge, Judge Wilkinson, uh, purported to be doing for constitutional theory and cosmic constitutional theory, eschewing all grand theories. But then it seems to me there's another different way of reading you, which is that, in fact, you are a participant in those debates about grand theory, and you are emphatically embracing one, which is purposivism, that the lodestar in constitutional interpretation is legislative purpose. To respect Congress and do one's job as a judge properly means to try and discern legislative purpose. That's the basic objective. As, and the means is also one that's conducive to doing that, namely examining legislative history among other materials. So I don't think you can be doing both. Uh, and the question is, wh which one is it, in fact, that you are doing? I think that uh, you know, I, I obviously have a, um, a view that um, one should try to figure out what Congress was trying to do. And so loosely put, that is a purposivist view. But um, I think where I differ from uh, the academy is that the academy is, uh, goes back and forth in terms of all of these normative conceptions about um, how statutes should be interpreted. And what I'm trying to say is, well, um, let's, let's see what Congress, which makes the laws, uh, what do they have in mind in terms of how that interpretive uh, enterprise should be undertaken. And um, uh, not that we are rigidly bound by that, but we as judges should at least be sensitive to that. And so um, what was missing, I think, in the uh, academic debate was really an empirical understanding of how Congress actually functions or at times doesn't function. And um, um, and when you then look at how Congress actually functions, then I think in some ways there should be less of a debate than there is. Because uh, if you look at how Congress actually functions, you see, as I point out in the book, that it is a bipartisan uh, perspective of, uh, of legislators, Republican and Democrat, that when you're trying to understand the meaning of a statute, that you should not, um, as a matter of first principle, um, essentially uh, reject uh, materials like um, the conference committee reports at the, uh, the, the last document associated with legislation. Um, if you look at every um, 
confirmation hearing of a Supreme Court justice, going back to uh, Justice Scalia, and you look at um, uh, Charles Grassley, Charles Grassley, today chair of the Judiciary Committee, he will ask every, every nominee, what is your view of legislative history? And he will say that while he uh, very much agrees with Justice uh, Scalia's jurisprudence, that he differs with him strongly on the uh, use of legislative history. And, and, and he'll say why it's important. Um, and so I think that if you think about it in terms of a bipartisan institutional perspective within Congress, then I think um, from my point of view, from a judge's point of view, it's no longer uh, an academic debate. It's really how can we uh, interpret legislation consistent with our responsibilities that is mindful of what a coordinate branch thinks is important in terms of how we go about doing our business. We can't dictate to them how to do their business. They can't dictate to us how to do our business. But I think that uh, understanding how the other branch works can be, can be important. And it might just be helpful, getting into the, the nuts and bolts of this, to walk through and you do do this very nicely at the end of the book with the cases that you've had to decide, but how this really plays out. So you approach a statute. Um, there's some ambiguity. So, so then you move to the legislative history. How do you know really when you have a hard case, an easy case, and when you need to move to those materials? Do you come to it at the same time and so on? I think, I mean, that's a very important question because I think what it, it highlights something, and that is, uh, the difference, sharp differences that sometimes made in the literature between purposivists and textualists is, is overdone. That uh, the so-called uh, purposivists, uh, when a statute is, is unambiguous, when the, the phrase they're interpreting is unambiguous, they may test it against the larger statutory structure to confirm that it's unambiguous. And that sort of ends the, the inquiry. They don't go beyond. Uh, materials, uh, beyond the text, other materials, I should say. And, and similarly, the so-called uh, textualists will um, look to dictionaries. They'll look to extra textual uh, sources. So it's, uh, in a sense, we're all engaged in the same enterprise, and it's really a difference in, in, in nuance and in, in degree. I'm only too happy when um, I see a statute that can be understood in terms of its textual meaning. And um, as I say, I will, text, I will test it against the, the whole statutory structure just to make sure I've not missed something. Sometimes you realize, oh, this is more ambiguous than it seems. And then your inquiry may be uh, expanded to look at um, reliable legislative history um, uh, materials. So an easy case is is one where the directive is, is, is quite clear. You know, it shall be uh, you know, a crime uh, to possess uh, 75 grams of, of a drug uh, having pseudoephedrine base. Um, uh, and so if you're caught with you know, 20 grams and you know that you fit within the statute, there's not much is not much more in terms of the interpretive um, enterprise. But um, other cases are more complicated. Um, for instance, um, I had a statute where the question is, what does convicted in any court mean? Does convicted in any court mean any court uh, in the United States? Or does it mean any court um, in the world? And um, uh, our panel, my panel, uh, said uh, it's a close case. You could see why, you know, if somebody's committed a, a crime in uh, a, cr a crime of murder in some other country, that maybe it should be uh, taken into consideration uh, if we're set in our own scheme, if we're sentencing, if there's been a prior conviction uh, punishable by imprisonment. Um, but on the other hand, um, what if uh, a country has um, 
a law that um, says that uh, you, you cannot uh, exercise uh, your, your, uh, the, the freedom of, of religion, um, let's say the Jewish religion in you know, Saudi Arabia or whatever, and you're, you're con convicted of that, and somehow you escape and you, you get here. And um, um, why should a crime in some other country whose values are different um, than ours, uh, why should that count? Um, so, um, in the end, we, we said, well, we think the better meaning, although it's a close call, is to say that uh, convicted it, uh, in any court means, according to the conventions of our uh, understanding, means courts in our, in our, in our country. Um, the court agreed, the Supreme Court agreed with that view, but there was a difference of view, Justice um, uh, Thomas and uh, wrote a dissent, which Justice Scalia joined. I think somebody else joined. I later asked Justice Scalia about that case. He says, very close. It could have really gone um, uh, either way. Um, so there are some cases that are more, more complicated than others. Um, I um, uh, also would be the first to say that sometimes legislative history is not, is not useful. Um, as Justice uh, uh, Ginsburg would say, she approached legislative history with hopeful skepticism. Sometimes it's, 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 uh, there's not much, much there. Yeah, I recently had a case, I won't go into details, where um, we found the uh, legislative history wasn't particularly uh, useful, and we were looking at it in terms of, of, of just the canons of statutory interpretation. Um, and we were uh, affirmed um, six to two um, with uh, the majority. Uh, the majority was Justice Sotomayor, Justice Ginsburg, Justice uh, Chief Justice Roberts, um, Kennedy, um, Alito, and Thomas. And the dissent was uh, Justice Kagan and Justice uh, Breyer. And Justice Kagan said, well, she thought the legislative history was useful. So there can be de debates e about the uses of legislative history and the value even among those who would agree that legislative history has a place. So, so even in the easy cases where the language, the semantic meaning in the language, the plain meaning is just so emphatically clear and <coughs> the purpose based on that language is so clear, you know, you have a certain, right, you, you just, you're, you're in possession of a certain amount of a certain prohibited substance, for example. Are you, do you object in principle to looking at legislative history in that circumstance, or is it just, uh, to quote my colleague, judicial attention is a scarce resource, and there's just not enough time mm -hmm. in every case to do everything you possibly could, but if you had more time and you didn't want to watch the ball game, sure, check out the legislative history just to make sure what mm -hmm. appears clear is in fact clear. I, I have no objection to the idea of trying to, um, you know, if you want to confirm. Right. Uh, so no, I don't object to it. It's just that I don't know that it's that it's necessary. Um, uh, I, I think the uh, sometimes something can seem very clear, but turns out to be uh, not so clear. Right. And uh, I give an example in the book of a um, statute. Uh, in which uh, the uh, prevailing party, usually the parents, in a case involving um, uh, uh, children with disabilities, where um, handicapped education, where there are administrative proceedings, and the parents prevail uh, in those administrative proceedings. And um, it says that, uh, the statute says that um, uh, that uh, the prevailing parties will be entitled to uh, reasonable attorney's fees as part of costs. Now, reasonable attorney's fees as part of costs. So in this particular case, the um, consultants employed by the lawyers uh, in this case um, thought to be reimbursed uh, for uh, their, their efforts. If you look literally at the language of the statute, of that statutory phrase, you'd say it doesn't say anything about educational consultants. And so uh, how can that be 
thought of as being part of attorney's fees. But if you then look at that statutory phrase in the context of the statutory structure, it becomes obvious to at least some of us that what the statute was trying to do was to make it uh, easier for parents to pursue these kinds of cases. And so um, that led to at least some doubt in our minds, the panel's minds. Judge Newman <laughs> was on the panel, as I recall. Um, and so I, I, we looked at the legislative history. And there, the legislative history in the conference committee report clearly says that um, expert consulting fees are to be considered as part of the cost. Um, couldn't be clearer. And um, it's really only if you exclude that legislative history that you could really say that there is an issue. Um, the court, for other reasons, rejected our uh, interpretation. Um, what Justice Breyer said in his dissent was that what the court has done is to divorce law from life. And it was a very powerful phrase because I think, uh, respectfully, I think that's what the court uh, was, was, was doing in that, in that case. So um, if you look at statutory language in the context of the uh, uh, whole system by which Congress makes its laws, then looking at the conference committee report is important. There's a study by um, Abby Gluck of uh, Yale and um, Lisa uh, 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 Bressman at Vanderbilt. And that what they did was uh, to interview the congressional staffers. And what the congressional staffers said was that the most important thing beyond the text of a, a statute uh, is the um, uh, are the committee reports. And that's uh, what they look at. That's what they brief their members on. Um, and that um, what they don't look at, they don't uh, look at dictionaries. Um, they are familiar with some canons, but not others. Um, and so uh, that study, I think, uh, supports this view that uh, you have to understand a statute in terms of the uh, legislative process which produces that statute. Legislative history is not the law, but it can be helpful information in trying to understand what the law is about. So I, so I was persuaded, you know, we should look to legislative history, and as, as you say, and as, as you note, Chief Justice Roberts has said, not all legislative history is created equal. So, so then I was wondering, well, how do we know what to look to first and really what to give weight to? So that it, you know, it seems like you could say, okay, a committee report is going to be worth more than, say, a statement made on the floor. But you could also imagine in a certain situation, maybe a statement on the floor is more candid or you know, maybe in a, in a particular situation you'd want to give that more weight. So I was wondering, do we have canons almost when it comes to figuring out which piece of legislative history to look to and how to go about that process? I think, um, thanks for that question, because I think, to me, when I think about legislative history, I'm looking at a very narrow range of materials. I look at the uh, conference committee report. Uh, the House and Senate have passed to different, different versions of the bill. They get together to come up with a final bill, and the conference committee report uh, discusses what the uh, compromise is. And sometimes it's actually the bill that's voted on. So the conference committee report is important. The uh, committee reports coming out of each committee uh, can be uh, important. The statements of the floor managers, which are often scripted uh, colloquies, um, are important. As the bill is about to be passed, that, that though those statements um, are uh, important. Uh, markups can be important. Um, um, they're not always as easily available, but increasingly so. 
But basically, the conference committee reports, the committee reports, and the statements of the floor managers. Beyond that, if some legislator gets up and just not involved in the process, um, gets up and says something about what the bill is about, it's not something that I would place much weight on. Um, I don't place much weight on, on congressional hearings because they are information gathering um, and are often ways of identifying issues. Um, so by looking at a, a narrow range of, of sources, you increase the chance that you will be looking at documents that have some reliability. So there are, whatever your approach to interpretation, there are a variety of perceived advantages and a variety of perceived vulnerabilities. And so uh, I'm wondering uh, what you have to say in response to critics of legislative purpose as the point of interpretation and of legislative history as an important tool in determining uh, legislative purpose. So there are concerns about aggregation. How do you infer from one report or one statement that the entire House, let alone the entire Congress, is behind it? Um, there are problems of attribution. Uh, Justice Scalia has of, uh, often said that you can't assume that Congress is going to pursue any purpose no matter what, no matter what the costs. Sometimes there are multiple and conflicting purposes. Right? How, uh, why is it that notwithstanding all of those concerns, uh, we still ought to be purposivists and we still ought to look at legislative history? I think the, uh, that's a good question, uh, Neil. I think the, um, uh, the challenges to this uh, approach are, are, uh, are, are well-founded in, in many ways. The, the notion that um, Congress is, is, uh, is, is not an it but a they. Ken Shepsley and before him, Raiden, has got a long pedigree. Uh, the idea that uh, people in Congress are voting for bills for all kinds of reasons, so how do we know? Um, so um, that's why I would call myself a soft purposivist if I had to be labeled, and that is because it's, it's uh, at least we should try to understand what it is that Congress had in mind when there are these ambiguities. and. Uh, just as, uh, and just as Breyer has pointed this out, just as we attribute um, purposes to schools and churches and corporations, even though they are collections of different, uh, we should uh, not give up on the idea that maybe we can do it in, 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 um, uh, with respect to legislation. Sometimes you can't. Um, and that's why I, I'm not doctrinaire on this view. Uh, I recognize the, the difficulties. Um, my, my counter is, well, what's the, uh, what's the alternative? And the alternative, when you have ambiguous language, if you are not going to look at anything uh, but the ambiguities, and the uh, textualists will look not just at the uh, statute, uh, they will also look at uh, statutory structure, they'll look at dictionaries, um, canons, and canons, judicial precedents. Exactly. Um, and so that has to be understood as well. And, and that can be, that can work um, in many circumstances. But um, the danger is that when you're left with uh, these um, A uh, legislative process uh, materials, um, that you wind up substituting as a judge, your own view of things, unmoored from what Congress actually had in mind. So um, what is the harm by looking at a conference committee report where um, the members have said clearly on that conference committee report that um, expert fees shall be uh, uh, included as reasonable attorney's uh, fees? Why would you exclude that from your interpretive tool um, as, a, as a matter of first principle by not even looking at it? That's my plea. Uh, it, it, legislative history may be useful, it may not be useful, but uh, we shouldn't reject it as a matter of, of first principle. I, 
I want to say, though, that um, uh, in the context of this discussion, uh, Neil and Marin, that the uh, textualist uh, critique of legislative history, as I've pointed out, I've said many, many times, has been invaluable because there have been, there's certainly many excesses uh, in judicial interpretation, interpreting uh, legislative history. Um, and we did have a time when uh, you, you would have Supreme Court cases which would say the um, uh, legislative history being ambiguous, we will now look at the text you know, clearly, clearly backwards. And I think that the uh, textualists have done a, a great service in pointing all that out. So uh, my difference is really one of degree, not, 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 not rejection wholesale of, of uh, the identification of concerns that the textualists have uh, very appropriately uh, made known. I, I take it part of the argument of the book is also we should look to what agencies do, because of course agencies, just as courts, have to be in the business of interpreting statutes all the time. And I think it's, it's helpful to remember that, because you, know, you can go through your first year of law school and forget that agencies do this at all. right? Um, and then as you say, so agencies do this all the time. And in fact, they look to legislative history. So that seems like one more reason why it's appropriate that we do so as well. Um, but then you also point out that more could be done to learn how agencies actually approach this. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Do we know, for example, um, do agencies have a, a uniform approach? So the EPA and the FCC, are they doing similar things? Um, is there consistency across time, really, when it comes to a particular agency? Or are these the kinds of things that would be helpful to know more about? Um, yes, I mean, uh, yes, it would be helpful to know more about. So um, the way that I wrote the book, the, organized the book, it begins with Congress. The next part is agencies, and then the next part has to do with courts. And that's not an accident, because I was thinking about the flow of the legislative interpretive process. And most uh, legislation is written in the first instance with an eye towards <coughs> what, what agencies will do. And uh, Peter Strauss made this <coughs> observation years ago that agencies are the uh, primary uh, interpreters of statutes. So when Congress passes a law, it's thinking about uh, how agencies are going to interpret it, what rules they're going to uh, issue, uh, what they're going to do pursuant to the, the passage of legislation. And um, I knew this from my own work where uh, uh, in my earlier days when I was looking at uh, administrative agencies that uh, a large part of their efforts were devoted to figuring out what Congress's expectations were. And um, there, looking at, uh, for example, a committee report was a routine aspect of what they did. And it sort of stands to reason. So if there's a committee report that comes out of, of a congressional committee uh, that directs the um, Secretary of Agriculture to do um, X, within uh, 90 days, um, you couldn't imagine the Secretary of Agriculture saying committee reports are not part of the uh, legislative uh, product, so I'm not going to look at it. Uh, because the consequences of uh, not looking at uh, these committee reports in terms of the authorizations of the agency, of the budget of the agency, could be um, severe. So uh, what I suggest in the book is that it would be useful to know what agencies' uh, methodologies are. And I understand that some have um, begun, a, I recommend it to the Administrative Conference of the United States that they do a study on this. I don't know if they're doing a study, but I think there's some scholars looking at, beginning to look at how agencies look at things, uh, and they may look at it differently. Now, a point that I make is when I say that we might learn something from agencies, I am looking, my concern is with um, pre-enactment uh, materials, not with uh, post-enactment materials. Agencies are concerned with both pre-enactment and post-enactment. 
they're as much concerned with what does the current Congress think about a law that was passed uh, 25 years ago as they are with what uh, that enacting Congress had in mind. Whereas we as judges um, cannot be uh, relying on, 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 on uh, post-enactment legislative materials. So it's a different enterprise, but at the same time, there's something we can learn from agencies. So let's, let's think together about possible f solutions for the problem as you see it. You mentioned um, Judge Kaufman earlier as a walking violation of the separation of powers, and I think this book is in the spirit of saying it's not just separation, it's, it's interrelation. The system is supposed to work, it's supposed to function, right? There are right. no equal branches of government. Um, and so how do we get to the point where more judges view Congress that way? Um, one creative solution might be to condition judicial budgets on examination of legislative history. I don't think right, oh, you no. recommend that. No, I wouldn't. Uh, but that's what the agencies are worried about. Right. Uh, you can write books, and books are great. I right. can read them, right? But right. there's a limited effect uh, that books have. Um, you could have classes, right? right? You can have judges. Um, you can have judges take classes taught by members of Congress and their staff, and you can have members of Congress and their staff take classes taught by judges, right? They can spend more time together. Again, they, that, doesn't, that seems like pretty tepid stuff. Now, earlier you were talking about, what about having more former legislators serve as judges? What about people who worked in Congress serve as judges? Justice Breyer did that. You have many more people who've worked in the, uh, clerked in the courts, worked in the executive branch. What about something like an OLC for Congress? Uh, have it be that it, it would be both, you, you'd be giving uh, members in, uh, really uh, good advice about how the courts are actually interpreting these statutes, and you might have a breeding ground for future judges, right? Not just those who worked at OLC and the White House Counsel's Office and DOJ. Uh, what are some ways that could really uh, make an impact beyond the sort of uh, relatively small bore interventions that I just mentioned, or on constitutional? <laughs> right. I have to say that, um, you know, by temperament, I'm uh, really quite uh, conservative and a slow, uh, slow bore, low bore, boring. Uh, we, say, uh, we say Berkey and uh, tireless tinkerer. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not the grand solution person because I'm always thinking of of what will go wrong and and what are expectations of institutions and. And I guess my first rule is do no harm. So that's, you know, you, you know I'm, I'm not the best person to think in terms of those grand approaches. But I do think that uh, there are things that can happen at the, can be done at the, certainly at the, at the margins. And uh, so an example is um, the project that um, I, um, conceived of with Judge Coffin years ago that is now um, actually part of the um, pro program of the Judicial Conference, whereby um, opinions of the Courts of Appeals identifying perceived problems in statutes or possible problems in statutes are sent to Congress uh, for its consideration. And the, the, the way that project came about was that um, I'd done a study uh, for the DC Circuit uh, bef you know, years before I was judge and um, at their invitation. And they were interested in the question of what happens to their opinions um, after they get issued. And so um, I took a uh, sample of opinions and I went back to the committees and what I found was not surprising. Where uh, the case was of uh, dramatic importance, everybody knew about it, the committees knew about it. Um, where the losing parties had the resources to go back to Congress for a legislative fix, the committees knew about it. But it was really um, remarkable how many cases which didn't fall into those categories where uh, the committees were just too busy uh, and didn't really know what, was, what the, the, these decisions were all about. And so uh, we designed a process whereby um, 
each court uh, has the capacity uh, through its clerk's office. Um, so let's say that I'm sitting on a three-judge panel and I'm on a case and I, my panel sees what we interpret the law, but we identify a, a misplaced co a comma as being misplaced or not as being determinative of the result. And we just think this is something that Congress may uh, want to know about. Um, we don't tell them to change the law. We just say this is how we dealt with it, but you should see uh, how we dealt with it. Um, so we give it to the uh, clerk of court. The uh, clerk of court uh, then um, sends the um, opinion to uh, various offices uh, within the Congress. Um, the critical office is the uh, Legislative Council's office, the drafting office. The drafters read the opinion. When, we send, when the opinion is sent, it's sent just it's only the opinion with a cover letter that says, um, for your information, uh, here is an opinion that may be of interest. That's all it says. And the Legislative Council's office will read the whole opinion. They'll see where the problem that's identified. Um, they'll then go to the um, Committee of Jurisdiction, the staffs, and say, here is how this panel dealt with it. And then sometimes what will happen is uh, there'll be a legislative correction put in, you know, a few years later as part of a technical bill, or the sense will be the, the, the panel handled it correctly and uh, no legislative action needs to be done. So that's, the, the Legislative Council's office loves this project because their view is oftentimes these glitches come about because the uh, staffs and the Congress didn't consult with them in writing the legislation, so it becomes like a teaching, mm -hmm. a teaching tool. Uh, and the legislators, bipartisan uh, legislators, uh, also like it because it's a way of, of keeping the courts, uh, the Congress informed of what the courts um, are, are doing. Um, so I think that sort of thing could help, but I, but I also think that um, Things like in baby judges school, um, where you have new judges who are learning about all kinds of things having to do with criminal law and sentencing, all these important issues. Um, a, a session on um, statutory interpretation could be, could be useful. And uh, he, I do think that at least sensitizing um, Judges to that could be useful, and and uh, similarly for uh, congressional staffs beyond the judiciary committees uh, staffs, um, having something available to them about the judiciary, I think, and 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 the interpretive process could be could be useful uh, as well. So uh, I, I think you know that there's no magic magic. Uh, solution to any of this. Um, when I was at Brookings, there would always be that last chapter. Uh, you have to write <laughs> the solution. And I always, descriptive part. descriptive part. And I think I always frustrated everybody at Brookings because <laughs> I'd say, well, if you do this, maybe that would work. But on the other hand, that could lead to more problems. And so, I, you know, I'm not, I, I, I'm not I don't have the magic solution, but I, I think there are things we can make, do to make things a little better. Yeah. I'm with you on this. I find I am always calling for greater transparency, right? That seems right. like the safe way to go. Um, but so as, as an incrementalist myself, I was wondering about another possibility here that you touch on in the book, which is that judges, of course, in their opinions, can, can note that there's, <laughs> this is perhaps an area that Congress might want to revisit, um, that this has caused some confusion or ambiguity and so on. Um, and I was wondering how we should think about that. Does that, do those kinds of statements in the opinion themselves, um, does that seem like it's part of an appropriate dialogue? Does that seem like it's actually going too far and it's better to take these other routes first? What should we make of that? I, I think that, um, at least for myself, that uh, I think it is appropriate to say here's an issue that Congress may wish to con consider or uh, revisit without saying what they should actually do. But just because I think to say this is what they should do, thrust the courts into uh, 
uh, the legislative process in a way they shouldn't be involved. They are not supposed to be legislators. But at least identifying the problem is something that could be useful to the, to the members. And, and, um, and Justice uh, Ginsburg, you know, as you all know, uh, will, uh, in her opinions, say this is a matter that Congress may wish to attend to. And I think that that's um, wholly, uh, wholly appropriate. So we're, we're almost out of time. And I would, uh, at least from my own point of view, be remiss if I didn't ask you one question about the politics of statutory interpretation. So most judges don't have I, a theory. I think Marin is going to have a great answer for that question. <laughs> most judges don't have a theory He's of statutory fish. interpretation. And most judges don't have a theory of constitutional interpretation. They tend to be methodologically pluralist. Nonetheless, if you hear that a judge is a self-described text textualist, you have a very good sense of which political party nominated them. If you hear that a judge is a self-described purposivist, you have a pretty good idea of which political party nominated them. Uh, why is that? Is there something inherent? Well, first, do you, you know, do you dispute the premise? And yeah. if you do, I'll well, happy to give you plenty of evidence that yeah. would confirm it. <laughs> yeah. um, and then to the extent you don't dispute the premise, is, it, is there something inherent or essential about these theories? Or is it just more historically contingent when certain approaches arose and, who, and the adherence they gained and then responses to them? I mean, I, I, I think that, that I, I know you have the evidence, but I, I think that most uh, Judges I know don't rigidly say that um, they're one way or another. I mean, that's, yeah, it's true of most judges. That's true of most judges. And so um, I think that's important to, 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 to point out. And so, um, uh, and, and it's most judges I think we need to be, need to be uh, concerned about. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, some of the uh, contentious cases, the, the high-profile cases um, in the last term uh, of the court, for example, the, uh, the Burwell case, uh, who, wrote that, who wrote that majority opinion that is essentially a purposivist approach? It's certainly, it's, it's both, but it's certainly a lot more purposivist than it needed to be to reach that outcome. And, had a plan. and it was written by right, Chief Justice Roberts. Right. Yeah. So, so James Q. Wilson. Uh, well, you, what you're well, really doing now is just disputing the premise. Right? <laughs> James Q. Wilson. James Q. Wilson, who was uh, uh, a leading conservative uh, theorist and uh, a great mentor, used to say that to label is to ignore. Mm -hmm. And I've always. Uh, uh, I've repeated that many times, and so I think rather than label, I think we can we can go beyond that. So okay. I'm sorry I haven't really answered the question. That's okay. That's okay. You're not the first judge not to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Who has answered it? I'm very curious. Um, well, you you can tell me afterwards. Yeah, <laughs> there's also a difference between public and private. Standards. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Good question. Good question. Worth worth asking. Okay. Yeah. Got time for a, a question or two? Sure. Yes. Hi, thank you very much for coming in today um, and for your presentation, Dutch. Um, this is sort of a follow up on Professor Siegel's question, but in your view, where does the intent of the majority party in Congress fit? Because they're the party that controls the process and controls the gates. Um, so, how do we look at statutes with a view to what that intent was versus the intent of the larger body? I think that in terms of, that's a very good question. I think that, that the way to think in terms of legislation is not in terms of party politics, but in terms of the uh, uh, process with respect to that passage of that bill, which uh, is, is, is not necessarily party driven. Um, the, um, uh, it may involve a coalition of different you know, political elements. I'm not so, uh, I don't really look at party in, in terms of understanding legislation. Um, I think that's very fraught. Um, I think in terms of the uh, infrastructure of Congress and the way that committees have responsibility uh, for the passage of, uh, for, for, for 
who are working through bills, um, and that um, the other members of Congress tend to defer to the representations about the bill given by the majority and minority members of that of that of that committee, and so um, and that's true uh, historically in terms of the way the process works, um, and, and I think um, w we have to think about the hierarchy of of institutional structure within the Congress and the hierarchy of communications within the Congress more than uh, we do about the partisan makeup of the Congress. Um, so, good question. Well, this has been uh, quite, uh, quite an illuminating conversation, Judge. Thank you so Great much. Great questions. Uh, for Thank your you. generosity with your time. Thank you. Thank you.